this video, we'll take a look at some additional muscles on the posterior forearm. Often these muscles get omitted from undergraduate anatomy and physiology courses due to the fact that many professors like to stick with teaching the main, larger, visible muscles. So let's go ahead and get started. First, there's extensor indices. This muscle will help us point things out. It attaches to the ulna and pointer finger. Specifically, this muscle originates from the distal one-third of the posterior ulna and interosseous membrane. It inserts onto the extensor digitorum tendon that runs to the index finger. When it contracts, it'll help to pull the index finger into extension, allowing us to indicate which donut we want with our morning coffee. And, like many of the other posterior forearm muscles, it's innervated by the posterior interosseous nerve, which is a branch of the radial nerve, and it receives its blood supply from the posterior interosseous artery. Next up, we've got extensor digiti minimi. This muscle helps to move the little finger, or the pinky. It attaches to the humerus in the pinky. Specifically, it originates from the lateral epicondyle of the humerus. It then inserts onto the tendon of the extensor digitorum that goes to the little finger. When it contracts, it acts to extend the little finger, like when one's trying to be fancy. It's innervated by the posterior interosseous branch of the radial nerve, and it receives its blood supply from the posterior interosseous artery. The index finger, pinky, and thumb have separate muscles to extend them. This is most likely due to the fact that we often use these fingers in more skillful ways, like when we perform detailed movements, operate tools, play instruments, and make hand gestures when we communicate. The supinator is often forgotten when covering the forearm muscles, but it's an important muscle. It helps us to do things like turn screws so we can build things like houses and other important structures. The supinator is named for what it does. It sits deep to the wad of three muscles, the brachioradialis, extensor carpi radialis longus, and brevis, right on the shaft of the radius. It attaches to the humerus, ulna, and radius. Specifically, it originates from the lateral epicondyle of the humerus and the proximal ulna. So because this muscle has two origins, it'll have a superficial layer and a deep layer. This is significant because the nerve that innervates the muscle passes between these two layers and could become entrapped. The supinator then wraps around the radius and inserts onto the proximal one-third of its shaft. When it contracts, it acts to supinate the forearm. An easy way to remember the difference between supinate and pronate is when you supinate, you can hold a bowl of soup. When you pronate, you pour the soup out. The supinator is innervated by the deep branch of the radial nerve, which passes between the superficial and deep layers of the muscle. Once the nerve emerges from the supinator, it's then called the posterior interosseous nerve, which runs down the back of the forearm, on the posterior side of the interosseous membrane. It receives its blood supply from the radial artery, interosseous recurrent artery, and the posterior interosseous artery. Here's a question for you. Why do they make screws screw in in a certain way? Have you ever heard of righty tighty lefty loosey? There are a few reasons for this. One, we tend to screw screws in to construct structures more than we tend to unscrew them. Number two, most people are right-handed. And number three, supination is a stronger movement than pronation is. Why is that? Think about the muscles involved with each movement. When we pronate, we use muscles like the pronator teres and pronator quadratus. If you think about the size of those muscles, those are relatively small muscles. When we supinate, we use the supinator, but we also use another powerful supinator, the biceps brachii. When we compare the number of fibers that pronate versus the number of fibers that supinate, we can see that there are more fibers that supinate. And remember, more fibers means more cross bridges, which means more tension is produced. And this, of course, translates into more strength. So the reason screws work on this righty-tighty-lefty-loosey principle is that it makes it easier for more people to use them. I hope you found this video helpful. If you did, please consider clicking like and subscribing to my channel. 
Don't forget to turn on notifications to get alerted to all my latest videos. For more helpful anatomy and physiology study resources, visit www.humanbodyhelp.com.